you got to start looking for those little pieces of opportunity and start playing the handwriting. It starts every single day and it starts with discipline. It does still require hard work. It's keeping your nose clean as much as you can and, and moving forward every single day, but not playing the victim. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already discovered the four pillars of a smart practice, get your free on-demand video training at smartpracticemethod.com. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. BIM, as we know, is very important, but it's not the only thing you need for your next project. That's why it's important that 95% of manufacturers who offer free BIM files on RCAT also have another type of data for your project needs. That means that if you go to RCAT.com, 95% of the products with BIM also have CAD files, also have a specification, as well as being able to use the patented spec wizard tool. And they also have project information to help you make the right selection for your next project. So stop going to a site with just BIM. Go check out our sponsor, rcat.com, to get everything you need for your next project for free and without registering, which is pretty cool. That's rcat, A-R-C-A-T dot com. Now, about today's episode. As architects, we're passionate about a great many subjects, including the built environment, social issues, sustainability, and more. But today, our guest asks a question. Is the focus on activism by our national advocates within the industry, the American Institute of Architects, the Royal British Institute of Architects, and more, is this focus on activism a double-edged sword? In this episode, Lance Psycho, who happens to be the principal of the architecture firm F9 Productions and co-host of the popular podcast Inside the Firm, shares his take on the focus of activism in the architectural industry as we discuss this important topic between myself, Enix Sears, Ryan Willard, and Lance Psycho. And with that, here is today's episode. All right. Well, what do we want to what do we want to discuss today, Lance? Do you remember what what the uh, the talking points were that that occasioned this this uh, conversation? You know what I've been looking at this morning. I've been on a binge. So um, forgive me for not remembering her name, but she said "cult of design," and I thought, what does oh, that yeah. even what does that even mean? Uh, so mm. I started thinking of what it means from a university standpoint because that's where it starts. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the I brainwashing feel, begins. Yeah. And and so I teach, uh, Ryan, I don't know if you know that. I also teach. I only do one course a semester, um, mm-hmm. but I do teach at, at CU Boulder. So I see all of the DI, I call it DIE because it needs to die, the diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity. I'm much of the opinion that, that Jordan Peterson is of of that stuff. So that that's where I started thinking about this conversation today was Okay, there's the the cult starts there. Why does it start there? I think even if uh, the political spectrum of the university shifted, so right now it's it's inarguable that I would say less than ten percent of university professors, lecturers, or anybody are right of center politically. However, you want to define that. I mean, there's objective truth to that. You know how you could do that, whatever. Let's say it flipped, and there was it was a bunch of right wingers running the universities. To be, I'm trying to be objective and a little bit of an egalitarian here and say like, okay, they, they, could, they would lead their own sort of cult in a way. And it, because you're not going to remove young people. I mean, at this core, it's like young people who are very malleable and are in a position and are under positions of authority from a professor, a lecturer, that, that's where the, that culture starts, right? So either way... It's going to be, uh, you know, this this cult of of design. If we then categorize it and put it bit down into the architecture uh, discipline and everything like that, I remember when I was a student. Obviously, uh, it wasn't too long ago, and feeling in that, you know, getting those kind of feelings about it. I mean, when you are in architecture school, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, especially with you guys, but probably the audience too. Is like, it it's everything for the five years. It's like all you care about and you want to, and you completely immerse yourself in it and, and good for you or me or anybody else who does it. That's where you get that 10,000 hours. And that's where you become, that's where you learn design. Design is very difficult to teach. Universities do a good part in that, but at the same time, right? Like, okay, who's running the ship? What are, 
the objectives behind the ship. And then now we have this acronym that's playing into the whole thing, which that's kind of the crux of the problem, in my opinion. And then it, it's... So Lance, tell me, catch me up. Tell me, you know, I purposely insulate myself from news media and I kind of stay out of that. Uh, I do... I do like listening to some Jordan Peterson shorts every now and then on uh, on YouTube and uh, love a lot of what he says. Um, what is this context of what you're talking about here with the, the DIE and what you're seeing at the university level and some of the potential brainwashing of students? Yeah, so uh, in society, I, uh, maybe you guys agree or disagree, but I, I, we overcorrect. Uh, we overcorrect in a lot of ways, culturally, politically. Even economically, we'll end up overcorrecting. We go too far in one direction, and then we overcorrect the other way. So I believe we're in an overcorrection in the, in the area era of of wokeness. And where that came from, I think it's important to know where that came from. So there was a series of lawsuits that came out in the '80s and '90s against some of these big corporations. Um, I, I can't na- I can't name them right offhand, but about like uh, discrimination in the workforce in those kind of institutions whether it was sexism or racism, and whether they were true or not, uh, th- there's got to be a, probably a half-truth to it, especially if they just took it by the numbers. Um, and so then the idea, the overcorrection has been since then is this acronym, which is diversity, inclusion, and equity. And just for the sake of itself, right? So <clears throat> instead of us having this society where, especially in the United States, where it was based on meritocracy, um, and we were trying to move towards that, and we were trying to just pick the best people and select the best people for the job, regardless of sex, uh, sex or uh, race or religion or anything like that. Then now we've swung back to the opposite of that, and we've said, okay, first, the first thing we're going to look at is is your race, and then we're going to intersect that, and that's where this idea and this term of intersectionality comes into play is. We're going to take all of it. We're going to take, for instance, we're going to take your, for uh, your, we're going to take into consideration your race. We're going to take into consideration your, your sex. Then there's all the gender ideology, ideology coupled with that. Um, and then we're going to, however many times you can intersect those things, then the bigger victim you are and the more you will play into the idea that we are going to make whatever institution it is more diverse because of that. So it is the opposite of a meritocracy. It is the opposite of trying to pick the best people for it. And the the biggest problem I have with it is not the idea of recognizing that, let's say, uh, 50 years ago compared to now, that there were less female engineers in the university, engineer candidates, as there are now. I'm okay with that discussion. uh, But if I'm okay with that discussion, then... I think the universities or any other institutions like this, if, they're, if they really mean what they're saying in terms of the word diversity and inclusion, then where are the right of center uh, folks included in that discussion without being shouted down or fired or not even hired in the first place? It's just calling the, the, the kettle black. I mean, that's, that's where it's at. For me, and that, that's my problem with it. Um, and then the people who we've been accused uh, on our show multiple times before, gotten some strange emails from folks. Uh, for instance, there was this, uh, this lady out of Canada who once emailed Alex, and I'll never forget it, uh, because he was just blown away by the email. The email came to us, and she said, uh, she goes, I was really excited when I first found your podcast. But then I went to your firm's website and I saw that you were a mostly male. And I think we were completely male at that point. This would have been like four or five years ago when we first started. And she said, I was really excited about your podcast because you guys told the story from the beginning and you just laid it bare. And like for people that like me are starting up a business, it's very important to hear how you guys did it and what we could learn from you and all those things. But I was so disappointed that there were no women in it. And so Al, mm-hmm. being the Al, the kind of guy he does, he goes... He first he was shocked, obviously, and then he goes like, "Who is this?" He went and looked up their website. Who do you think she had hired? All females. Mm. So I'm okay with I'm okay with that discussion coming towards me, but I think there's a lot of people shouting on the other side that don't even realize the same things that they're accusing me 
of doing whether it's true or not. And I hire by meritocracy for the record. I, 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 wanna, I want the best people. Why wouldn't I want the best people? Uh, so there's been those kind of interactions too. And where, where that's, that's the problem. Like it, it's not, it's not true that they really want this diversity inclusion and equity is a whole different, uh, discussion, right? Because what does that even mean? I've been on many shows with, in the architecture community on some of the, a high profile show, just like this, uh, not your guys's, but a different one. And I have point blank asked a commit people that are all about this kind of committee. What does equity mean to you? Like, tell me what it actually means to you. Because I, and I wish more people would push back on it because if we don't, if we don't make them define it, they're just going to take it. Like, equity by definition is capital or property. So what do you really mean by taking that equity from one place and putting it to another? Like, let's just take the mask off already. Mm. Uh, certainly, certainly dial into a, a big conversation that's happening here in the um, in, in, shall we say in, um, well, here's, here's, what's interesting. I'm going to bring up something else here. Like this is a, a dialogue that's happening in generally developed nations. Right. And it seems like these conversations start, it, it almost, it, here's Enoch's philosophy. This is Enoch's personal opinion. Uh, it seems like when human beings get to a certain level of comfort, we start to look for areas in which we can experience mm. some opposition. Okay. I just know from my personal experience, so I lived in Honduras, Central America for two years. And uh, I never saw, literally, I can probably count on the, my, on my hands and my toes how many, how many Caucasians I saw when I was living down there. As you can imagine, Honduras is a very homogenous place. Um, great country, great place to live. I'll live. Also one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. At the time, it was the second poorest nation in the hemis Western Hemisphere. And uh, let me tell you, I guarantee no one in Honduras is worried about diversity, equity, and inclusion. No one, right? They're not worried about racism. They're not worried about any of that. However, what I did find is that there was a lot of racism down there. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not a good thing, but there's a lot of racism, you know? And and so it part of me wants to think, like, when we look at this, this conversation uh, pushing a lot of these uh, for instance, you brought up diversity, equity, and uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Seems to be, seems to be, you know, a lot of times comes from the academic circles, mm -hmm. right? I don't see, you know, I don't see the working class people up in arms about this, other than the people who get riled up about it, um, um, feeling like feeling like they're victimized. So, in any case, just a general observation. Don't know where I'm going with that, um, but it does tie into a, a bigger conversation. That's something that that is on my mind constantly, which is like. What do we do with the gifts, with the abundance, with the wealth that we have as uh, as a nation, particularly the United States of America right now? You know, we kind of have, we for the past 150 years, we've enjoyed a leadership role in the world in the fact that we've had a lot of the world's resources. And so what do we do with them? How do we how do we act with this big responsibility that we've been given? And then as it rolls over to the architectural industry, talking about this idea of the cult of design, where are we putting our focus as as architects and as designers and as thought leaders who are in <clears throat> developed nations that have a large majority of wealth? Where are we putting the conversation? And are, are we pushing humanity forward? Are we squabbling? Are we focused on things that are inconsequential? And what's the actual stage of the arch? Like, what is the actual state of the industry of architecture? You know, I got off a call yesterday with two architects, as a matter of fact, that I spoke to, and um. One of them, he'd been in business for three and a half years, and uh, and he'd, you know, he, he'd went. He came from a firm where he was doing some pretty impressive commissions. When he went on his own, he started at the bottom, was doing like a lot of residential additions and things like that, and won a, a, a decent sized project. But I asked him, you know, we were just having a conversation about the challenges he's experienced in his firm. It was really sad because he got to a point where he was, he said. You know, he's all honestly. I'm. I'm honestly thinking about throwing the towel. I don't know if this is worth doing this anymore. You know, and I said, "Well, why is that?" He says, "Well, the cash flow is very inconsistent. I have to work. It feels like I'm working all the time, and even when I'm not working, it feels like I'm thinking about the business all the time because there's so many loose pieces and things. I don't have enough money to hire anyone. I'm scared to take that next step because I don't have confidence in the work coming in in the future." He's like, not only that, but my own personal income has been very spotty. I haven't 
So it's just depressing to look at it, you know? And I said, I said, well, what, what has your, what has your income been? He's like, well, I've barely, barely broke $50,000. And mind you, this, 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 this architect is in a, is in an area that is a resort area, not too far from where you're at, Lance, where there's a lot of money, there's a lot of vacation homes. Like he's literally sitting in the lap of abundance of like opportunity. And as I talk with him and just try to have an open conversation and, and an understanding conversation, because I feel for him, like I really do. You know, I've been there with different businesses that I've had where I feel like it's not going to work out and feel like, you know, I should throw in the towel. Uh, but what I could tell is that he had some very distinct mindsets about money and the role of money and the role of business that were completely sabotaging and getting in the way. And so the question I was asking in my head, and I didn't ask him directly, but I think I may in the future, is like, why don't you value what you do? Why don't you think you deserve to be paid? Because at the end of the day, it goes back to this victim conversation. We mm. can say that it's the world that's causing me not to be able to earn enough money. It's the world that's causing me to have to work. It's a state of architecture that I have to work so much. Architects aren't appreciated. You know, we're just undervalued. Now, all of that may be true. However, what role do we have in the matter? And does it matter whether we say that we're the victim of the external circumstances or whether we start to take accountability and we start to say, okay, the reason why my income is not $250,000, $500,000 is because I have not learned the skill sets, the mindsets, and the abilities to bring in $500,000. Yeah. Right? And so, but it's the story that I hear, and another woman who I talked to, she was the same thing. It was the same thing. I was just like... She's just, they're both of them. They're these broke, they're completely broke. You know, they look frazzled, they look tired. Um, and they're, you know, they're struggling I, having joy for, for, for the profession just because. So, the, so this, this, this is, you know, we, we've spoken about this a number of, a number of times and there, and it's, it's very similar sort of thing in the UK. And there's a lot of activism in architecture. I feel sometimes and i'm i'm not against it i just feel like it's a distraction from getting good at business and making money and having agency to do about to do something you know to be able to make a change if that's what if that's what's important for you and it starts at university and we have universities that are very good at um you know kind of getting students to be very articulate and thoughtful about designing with all sorts of imagined constraints from from you know physical environmental scientific political even um but yet they never take up the challenge of trying to speculate about money or where the finance is coming from from a project and actually university is a great place to start thinking about all of that stuff because it's you're not putting any of your money at risk um but it's not a conversation that ha that happens and so but then there are lots of other conversations and, um, you know, a lot of activism starts to happen at university and these sorts of topics start to become much more in the, at the forefront of generations of architects. And then when we come out into the professional world, there is this commercial um, fluency which is missing and then architects don't get a chance to sit at the table and make any conversations. And all the conversations that architects, architects are dealing with but you know the diversity inclusion equity these are societal issues these are big broad massive topics not that you shouldn't necessarily talk about them but there's a there's a there's a question of like get your own shit together first yeah like we need to be able to run a run a successful run a business which is able to pay people properly um we need to be able to learn about the the commercial intent we need to be i mean there's, there's, there's so many conversations that we've ended up having where, where there's a lot of people, architects, serving clients who they actively dislike. This is bizarre. This is a, this is a insane situation. Go into that and like, describe you know, what you mean like, a little bit there more, Ryan. Like this is, this is so, this is a, so, so a, a client in some cases, and again, the, the, the kind of philosophy of this will start at university. The client is an obstacle to realizing my architectural aspiration and dreams. And then we can cloak the architectural aspiration with, with a lot of virtuousness, if you like, because there's, it's relatively easy to do that. 
and then we can have a, com a continued and persistent complaint about what the developer client is doing and that they're greedy and that they're it's a it's kind of it can end up getting predictable um and then there's this tension that's involved and then the and then i'm sure clients in a way as well they might get a little bit of a suspicion about architects that that's what they're like and then they might pull away and then the architect has got now less agency to be able to influence um the project and again the not being able to meet a client where they're at financially and understanding what their business agenda is that's difficult now if you're kind of trying to run a practice and you're constantly getting you know you're blaming the client for not paying you properly it's not it doesn't it's not helpful it doesn't work it's not you know you're not going to be able to you're not going to matter to move forward with that so we'll we'll see it um you know clients uh, architects getting upset they don't like their their developer clients for example they're greedy they're capitalists they're not interested in the city sure there's a lot of evidence that might suggest you know uh, that people could give to around that but again kind of being frustrated with them right does that help wanting to work with high net worth individuals that's also another one that we see quite a lot of and that we'll often see lots of you know when we've seen it before lots of architects who are either doing pro bono work community work altruistic sounding work at the expense of their own business and at and the expense the of, their, the of, their, yeah. of their own team you're not mm -hmm. ready you're not in a financial situation to be doing this kind of community project stop okay it's great lovely well done but y y your business is not operating properly to you can't afford to do it so there's there's this kind of tension if you like and part of it again stems from um a, a lack of breadth within i think and with universities certainly not having interesting active conversations around the richness of business and around the kind of commercial fluency and intelligence that actually drives architectural form making if you like yeah i did a podcast uh, <clears throat> right before this one with a uh, a gentleman who he's only 18 but he uh came out of college at the height of covid and couldn't get hired and now he started his own business and um w you know one of the one of the things we talked about on there was universities he really he was happy that i had the perspective i did and that we teach and i said well, you know to try to be give the universities a little bit of credit if i just speak about the architecture universities it, uh, design is hard to teach i think they do a good job of teaching design even if they're not teaching economical design it's the mm -hmm. process of design it's the starting point it's the finish point. It's going through that whole process, uh, learning the software, drawing by hand, modeling, all, all that stuff. They do that well. They do that well. Uh, but they obviously are not preparing people for, okay, when you get into practice, how do you deal with the planning and zoning department, the developers, uh, the clients that are uh, need extra attention or, or whatever? I, I, this stems all the way back to the, my point at the beginning of the podcast is I would just like I would just like an open discussion and the, the truth to be told about it, because if the universities were just were honest about it in that they said, look, we're, we teach them design. We're good at teaching them design. We're bad at teaching them business of architecture. No problem. Start reaching then out to people like me or yourselves or other people. And then people who are listening to this, who are practicing architects. It, a lot of this then it comes back to like let's not be victims about it take the proactive approach reach out to the university because that's literally how i got hired all i did was reach out to them 10 years ago and said hey i've been trying to hire students they aren't up to par how can i help and then they said here's how you could help here's a course is this line up with you i'm like this is like actually perfect and then now we have several employees that were former students former tas and that's how kind of how the whole the whole system works you know, you talked about a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. So money uh, and how does all this play into this? And I, I actually appreciate that. Uh, you remind me of like, a, I don't know if you know who Dave Rubin is. Dave Rubin is a political commentator. And what he does is he takes a 30 day break from any media. He goes on a like sabbatical and then he comes back and he always does a podcast with somebody high profile like Glenn Beck or whatever. And then they tell him all this stuff. And he's just like, it's a, it's like one of the coolest mm. things to see on the internet, mm. I think. Mm. So, wow. I'll, so uh, the DEI business, DIE, is a $3.4 billion industry now. 
And we all know what happens, and, and like we're all capitalists here, but you know what happens when money gets involved with things. Um, it can either, it can either go really good or really bad, but it seems like there's almost no in-between with that. Uh, so that's one point I wanted to bring up. And then you talked about, okay, what does all this mean? And, and Ryan, I think you had a good point. Like, it seems like a distraction. Hmm. This seems like a distraction, but like we are being pulled into this distraction no matter what. Because if you just go to the AIA and you look up DIE, it's right on their webpage, right? There's a whole system dedicated to it. I'm sure they're part of this $3.4 billion industry at this point. They probably have consultants coming in to that. So while it is a distraction, people listening could argue, maybe they're screaming at the radio right now, like, then just don't ignore it, guys. Hey, we're, it's almost impossible to ignore it now. I'm here to tell you. Like, it is everywhere. It is ubiquitous. It's non-ignorable, and it needs, there needs to be an open discussion about it, because if it is then a distraction, okay, is it distracting us from doing, from, from like you said, Enoch, moving humanity forward, moving architecture forward, moving the business of architecture forward, and it, 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 like if, if everything is what used to be, you know, we used to have these hierarchies of competence. So the most competent people, the best people, just whatever race, color, creed, doesn't matter, the best minds were the most desirable. And if now we've flipped that on its head and now we've said, well, now we hire based on hierarchies of victimhood. Now we hire on, on hierarchies of anything but a straight white male. Are you hiring the best people for the jobs in whatever industry? Are you putting the best students in the universities? regardless of university i think i think probably not so what and this is an export so right now what we're in we're in a we're in a as a whole society in all these developed nations we are running an experiment with no scientific basis beyond behind it there's a scientific basis behind meritocracy there's a scientific basis beyond a hierarchy of competence it's obvious it's an objective truth if you are the best plumber who gets the job done the fastest and without any leaks, regardless of your color, that's the best plumber to hire instead of whatever intersectional figure you want to make up in your head right now, a gay, black, one-armed plumber. Do we hire that person first while they do the slowest job? They have the leaks just based on that first premise because that's what we're looking at first now. And for us, for somebody like me, by the way, who is a federally registered Native American, I have been called the N-word to my face multiple times in my life. I have experienced actual racism. I grew up on a Native American reservation. Is somebody not like me then? The people, the person that needs to speak up and say like, what this is, is racism. And it's not the way forward if we're looking to make the best humanity, the best cities, the best businesses, all of those things. Mm. I, I didn't know you grew up on a reservation. That's really well. interesting, Lance. It was all right. <laughs> what were we saying, Ryan? It's interesting as well because we we kind of start looking at the equality of outcome versus the equality of opportunity discussion, mm -hmm. and I think most of us would be in the camp of yes, we want to have the equality of opportunity because that's in line with a, with a meritocracy. Um, operation if you like but we want to be able to make sure that we've got the best you know a big range of people to be able to choose from yeah. in terms of to be able to find the best but then when it becomes about the outcome then there's issues there and it starts to put things it starts to put things into a slightly different situation yeah indeed you know, so it looks like you're yeah, no, he's pausing for dramatic effect. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so the you know my understanding and and I get it. The um, you know, actually, I had Karen Compton uh, on the podcast a while ago to talk about Jedi was the acronym. So I think it stands for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And um, you know, like as as a white male who grew up in a white middle class, lower middle class neighborhood. I mean, I don't know what it's like to grow up as an African American, a person of color in the United States of America. I don't know what it's like to grow up as a woman. I don't know any of that, right? And my understanding of these initiatives is that 
Uh, the people are looking at the fact that certain races are underrepresented in architecture, right? Um, certain genders are underrepresented, and let's not go with the uh, the, the 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 transgender stuff because that's pretty new. But just historically mm-hmm. speaking, uh, it, it seems to me that's where they're coming from, Lance. So I, I like to take. I, I mean. As we all do, I'd like to try to take a balance view of like, okay, what are they, what are they seeing that's causing them to want to make these changes or put this emphasis, right? Because the AIA is a large, it is, if you think about it, it's the de facto, what do you call it, um, 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 advocacy organization for architects. Whether we like it or not, the AIA has established themselves as sure. the voice of the profession. Right. And so wherever they focus, they have a lot of clout with wherever they focus their energy or their messaging or what they focus on is going to really drive the conversation. It's going to have a big impact. Right. Um, So the question is, why? Why is the AIA? Why are they putting such a huge focus on diversity, uh, inclusion and equity? I'm going to play completely dumb here. Pretend like I don't know the answer. And uh, let's have a conversation about why we think this is why is this even happening? I have one question. I just have a question that I would like to ponder while maybe Ryan has a has a better reaction to that, uh, Enoch. And that is, okay, l- let's say they're just focusing on architecture, which that's what you said. They're just focusing on the architecture because they see that they're, okay, 51% of the population is females, 49% is, is, is males in the world, in the world, okay, as a population. So if that's their metric and they're like, oh, okay, well, then the architecture profession should have, like if that's pure, true equality, 51% female, 49% male uh, in that. Okay. What, my question is, when is ever there a discussion about the following? 90% of roofers are male. 93% of loggers are male. 90% of veterans are male. 97% of plumbers, mechanics, carpenters. Firefighters, the most dangerous jobs in the world. Why don't I see a giant push in that direction? That's I, it's just a question. Well, no, it, I mean that's a very interesting observation, and that, that usually the conversation is circling around the the kind of more what's the word white collar types of professions and the C suite level executives and the positions of power and the decision making positions this is where the the conversation always orientates itself around in terms of um what enoch was saying so the question was why why is the aia kind of focused so heavily on these issues at the moment and this is becoming a a massive thing that they're doing i mean it's the same it's a very similar sort of thing in the uk where the ROBA is waving the banner of lots of these these topics, and one would only assume then that that's obviously they're 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 appealing to whatever their target audience is demanding, asking for. You would think so. That's that would I make would, sense. Yeah, uh, that's what that's what that's what I would I would assert or assume. It's a, yeah. Well, it's I a think good there's question. there's another. There's another, I'm going to throw something in the mix here, which is something that, that, that I've seen a lot, which is this idea of virtue, virtue signaling. Right. Virtue signaling, which is the fact that if I, I want to be, I want to be perceived as, as equitable, um, um, loving, compassionate, and an enlightened thinker, which is very different than being a compassionate, loving, and enlightened thinker, by the way. Right. So uh, uh, what, what it boils down to is that nobody, we're, we're the, the overall education and IQ of people in the developed worlds is probably at its highest level. We, we've had it right in the past century. Like if you look century over century, we're there. Uh, there's more people going to school now. Uh, so we know what I'm getting at is that people know history. Even though we seem to forget it, uh, we keep repeating or rhyming in the same mistakes, we still know the history. And so we don't want to be people who are going towards that, I think, are betting that they are going to be on the right side of history. This is the way I'm, I'm look at me, I have uh, done bent over completely backwards to put what was formerly just by statistics per capita 
people that were marginalized in these various professions, which I'm glad we addressed that it seems like it's mainly white collar. It seems like it's mainly positions of power. They don't, I, I think generally society, people in society do not want to be on the wrong side of history. And then you couple that with the mob effect, right? So you see people like Scott Adams, who said something controversial a couple weeks ago, or yay, former, art, artist formerly known as Kanye West. And or, or whoever, you just keep naming names, people like that. The mob comes after them, they're canceled. Dil- Dilbert is no longer literally in, in an American newspaper of any prominence in society. Adidas canceled everything with, with Ye, whether, whether you believe what he's saying or not. It was a controversial statement. So are we really about this idea of inclusivity and diversity? If we even, if for any kind of like a crazy comments maybe that, that they make, if you if that's your opinion of them, or is it really boiled down to hierarchy again? I, I thought Ryan's point was maybe he wasn't even trying to make it was actually kind of spot on. And what I was what I was hoping would get pulled out of it is like I pointed out the hypocrisy between an institution an institution like the AIA focusing in on elevating formerly marginalized people per capita in that profession. But no, but the hypocrisy on the opposite end of there's no elevating all of all, any, you know, the female gender, for, for example, or sex in these other categories that I said. The point about pointing out the, the hypocrisy is just to point out the, that fact. But really, it's about hierarchy. It's about a hierarchy of, of whatever is trying to be elevated in that way. Because if it was about equality, if it was about diversity, and if it was about inclusionary, then it would be across the board. We would be trying to elevate so that almost every profession was as close to that 51 to 49 as we have, as we can get. But since it's focused in a certain way, you got to ask that those next logical questions. And, and that's what leaves me frustrated at the end of the day. Um, I'm, if we, I would love to see more uh, f- women in the construction industry. I am a general contractor. No problem. I have seen a handful of my whole, you know, almost 30 years of doing this. Uh, they do a great job whenever I see them. It's no problem. The buildings I'm sitting in were insulated largely by a female. It's great. But I'm not seeing this across the board. Why are we picking and choosing? Are there, are there not? Is, first, first of all, I, I, I don't know within the construction industry, for example, are there not any kinds of campaigns and this this sort of thing trying to get more women into construction and blue collar works blue collar types of positions that doesn't exist or does it the nhab so it's the national association of home builders i i uh, am a subscriber to their newsletter and they're you know maybe one out of uh five maybe one out of six of the newsletters they're they're pushing for that there's certain groups doing that um mm-hmm. but i i guess the people i'm speaking about is the, you know, you've probably heard the statistic that uh, only 7% of Twitter users are responsible for like 95% of the content. Yes. So, exactly. So it's the these. The distribution here. Yeah. So can, it's these. I'm, I'm talking about these influential hyper fourth wave, for instance, feminists or, or mm-hmm. whatever category of any other DEI group you want to say. Being the loud vocal people. Seemingly, I don't hear any discussion about why don't we have any more more female loggers or, or whatever. That that's my focus. Yeah. No, and it doesn't it 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 doesn't provide a more rounded conversation at all. It really it it really doesn't. And again, the this idea of going back to the equality of outcome as opposed to the equality of opportunity. This is. I think where a lot of things start to to break apart. When we're looking at the in, the institutions, the RABA and the 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 AIA, I th- again, it's I'm very skeptical anyway of any large institution waving any kind of banner about anything. Mm. So when I see the banks here in in the UK having rainbow flags outside of them, and you know, kind of whatever kind of flag they've got, I'm like, like no, you don't care. You're just a, that's a, that's a, a, it's a corporate gesturing. It's empty. It's completely, em- it's completely empty. And it's, and it's, it, which starts to, um, you know, uh, 
there's a, there's a big part of all of this which is a which is to do with a marketing or a trend or popularism and trying to take sides like that and then again it, my my point will keep coming back to with the if we're looking at the architectural institutions that the 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 kind of running of successful architecture practices is the is the thing that then becomes negated yeah it's when i look you know this here's the thing like our business of architecture is founded around one premise and the premise is this that the key to resolving all these problems that we're talking about here is the the economic advancement of every individual okay let's just take that as a basis the beautiful thing about money is that money itself is not racist money itself is not prejudiced money itself has none of that people people that hold it yes indeed indeed cultures and corporations and everything sure you enter the human element but business of architecture the whole premise here is that by by ennobling and enriching so to speak the individual when people get resources then they're able to have a seat at the table right so what i hear is like a lot of times with advoc advocacy what we see is we see that um um advocacy being the means by which people are given opportunity right which is certainly we've seen it happen in history is certainly a valid way to give people opportunity right however what i believe is the better way and more powerful way is to help people develop the skills the attitudes the mindsets to succeed regardless of what their color is regardless of what their gender is regardless of whatever because we're all going to have, we're all going to have external things around us, trauma from our childhood, uh, economic disasters, uh, physical disabilities, mental breakdowns, whatever, you know, we're going to have these challenges in our life. And ultimately, what's really going to help us at the end of the day to overcome these things is going to be the internal skill sets, mindsets, abilities that we have as people to deal with the realities of the world. Yeah. One phrase I like to use is that we're all, every, everybody, no matter where they're at in the planet, they're dealt, if I make an analogy, they're dealt a hand of cards, right? Some people are dealt, uh, if they're playing poker, some people are dealt uh, a royal flush and they get the best hand right off the bat. Uh, and then some people are dealt a very low hand of cards, you know, a yeah. bunch of mismatched, just single figures. But you're all playing, a, you're all playing the game. You're all mm. playing the game, and what what I wish what I wish I heard more from that seven percent that I seven percent by the way left or right doesn't matter like that seven percent of people making almost a hundred percent of the noise on social media or podcasts or whatever kind of platform that is getting out to people if it's equal left or right doesn't matter I, I would like to hear more and maybe I'm just the person that needs to say it is like <clears throat> you need to recognize the heart of hands you're played. Or that that you were given, like that's a reality. Were you given a royal flush? Were you given the low hand? Were you given the middle hand? Whatever. Once you recognize the hand you were dealt, it's up to you. It's up to you, just you. It's all you. And yes, there are external factors, and maybe you grew up in a rough neighborhood, and and all that kind of stuff, and maybe. But th then it's on you to figure out. Okay, I have to play my hand extremely carefully and methodically. And I've and I've got to do it well. Like I have very little chance to play the wrong hand in as I continue this game. I have to keep leveling up, even if it's very slowly and incrementally. And even to the people who are Delta Royal Flush, I know many people, even in my family, my aunt, uh, my great aunt, they were bequeathed after they after their mom died, her mother in law died, sixty million dollars, sixty million dollars. Before that, they were pretty wealthy. Um, they, you know, they were, I would say, upper middle class, but that elevated them to a different level. And this is when I was like five or six. And so they were, they lived in Idaho. We lived in North Dakota, very far away. We saw them every once in a while, but everybody knew all of a sudden they were rich um, from the U.S. bank in system in uh, Idaho, in Boise. They lost it in seven years. Like, this is a reality that happens over and over again. So everybody's still playing this game. It's and it almost seems like the people with the royal flushes, from what I've seen, that's one of several examples I have in my life of people coming into this insane amount of money that they've never had before, and they just 
it's all gone very quickly. The people that are know, know that, it's like if you're listening and you're a person who thinks like, yep, I got, I got dealt a very low hand of cards. Okay. The other people too, I think it's very important that we are, we try to become as people, just humans, better dialectical thinkers. So we place ourselves in the position of somebody else to try to better understand the self and vice versa. And those people with the royal flush seems like they can lose it. It's, it's almost like they can lose it even faster than somebody who has got basically nothing. Think about your advantage. Okay, I've got nothing with this little bit of hand. Fine. Now everything is up from here. Every single day is better if you play your hand correct in that way. And I'm here. I am with you in the person who was dealt a very low card of hands. Graduated with a class of 20 people in a very, in a very rural place. No opportunities. Went to high school. No electives that I could take. As a result of somebody who even tested as a high IQ when I was young, low uh, B honors student, barely passed, uh, graduated with honors, didn't really care because of the lack of opportunity. Like, I get you. I hear you. But you got to start looking for those little pieces of opportunity and start playing the hand right. And it starts every single day and it starts with discipline. It, It does still require hard work. It's keeping your nose clean as much as you can. And, and moving forward every single day, but not playing the victim. It's just understanding your place, which completely relates back to Marcus Aurelius and the idea of stoicism. Stoicism is not about being quiet. It is not about just, you know, not talking to your wife and your kids at dinner. It is about understanding your place in the universe. And even if you are a pawn, what happens if you move the pawn? Step by step by step by step all the way across the board. You get to the end, you're a king. Like that's chess. That's a reality of chess. Mm, I love that. I love that. So that's a great, great analogy. I, I think it's been, I, say much more than that. I just <laughs> the pond. Well, the the I think this is a conversation of, of being able to find alchemy with your circumstances, like whatever. Like I love this kind of analogy of the the hand that you're that you're dealt. And the, certainly from like a coaching perspective, the idea of victimization or becoming a victim, if you're going to, if you're going to take that on as a way of thinking, then you have to be aware of the consequences and the loss of power that could arise from it. Okay. And that there are other ways of mentally dealing with your circumstances and interpretations and that there is an enormous amount of freedom if you like with the choice in how we get to interpret interpret how a circumstances are, is occurring for us and actually having the skill set and being able to interpret circumstances in a meaningful way which are empowering for us then that can lead to very different behaviors and outcomes and performance ultimately and it's 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 a very it's interesting my partner she's um she's she's black and we have she had a conversation with me a little while back we've had this conversation about you know raising a black child and what would be you know what the what kind of conversations do we want to ensure that our child is filled with and hears about and and she was like you know that there's there is a there is a reality that their experience will be different to that of a white kid, right? But that's not a bad thing. It's just a different experience. Mm-hmm. And that was very much the kind of philosophy that we were kind of coming, coming to. It was like that to be able to have the child to distinguish between different experiences and expect, expectations and to be prepared for their experience to be that different of their, of their peers but not but also not to expect it to be worse mm. and that mm. actually that, that it's just a different game that you're playing and that there is a different set of opportunities that you have that the other guys don't and that's the and and that's the game that's the that's the game and those are the kind of the mental tools and the ongoing conversations that will need to happen day by day with with any person of like okay what is what is it what what do i have to hand what do what are the resources that i've got what are the opportunities that i've that i've got this is not about you know if there's a, a position where it makes sense for you to be empowered to raise your voice and make a stand for something absolutely go and do that but when it but when we're kind of starting to 
label or, or take a stand or something and you're feeling disempowered and angry about it and it's not helping you produce the results that you want to have in your life then okay and now there's a now there's a now we can have a look at this and there might be something to let go of again these conversations are always nuanced and case by case like if we're doing it in a coaching example I'm, um it it you know that it can land in a very uncompassionate way to tell somebody you know you know you can do better you know that you can pull yourself up out of this situation but actually to have to have a one to one conversation to uh, acknowledge or give space for the totality of somebody else's experience okay great and then be able to start giving tools and this is where education really should be you know should be doing this giving people tools to be able to um unpick and dismantle and look at and observe and inquire around their own mental framework and make choices grown up adult choices is my mental framework helping is it leading me to the path where i want to go down yeah i, I don't have a good analogy for this but uh <clears throat> what because the opposite of this analogy rather i don't have a good analogy for the opposite of this reality maybe you guys do is i think the like a diamond right a diamond is created under intense pressure and heat mm -hmm. so it's one of the most sought after things on the planet right we spend how much of our salaries guys uh putting the diamond on on her finger so <laughs> social mary so mary is for all other reasons but uh, that and so when I when I coach people with business and I tell them and I give that analogy, it's usually in the context of they say, uh, "What what advice do you have?" You know, for somebody that's thinking about starting a business, and I go jump off the ledge and start the business. And mm -hmm. and then if you have the opportunity to jump off the ledge and start the business during a great recession or great depression, perfect, perfect. You're going to be under so much intense pressure and heat. If you survive, you're going to come out a diamond, a hundred percent. So what I'm getting at is like, what is the opposite analogy for that? And I've never been able to figure this out yet. Maybe I've it'll take one. me a big, big, oh, perfect is like, okay, now we're taking people and elevating the diamonds without going through the intense pressure and heat. So, so, so I, I heard this story on a personal development program I did a little while, years ago. And it was a story of a biologist who was collecting um, butterfly poop eye. And he had this, he had this, this poop eye and he was in, and he could see the butterfly wriggling around inside of it. And there was a tiny little hole, like microscopic little hole that this butterfly, you know, that started to emerge in the, in the poop eye sack, if you like, that the butterfly was trying to fight its way out of. Okay. So he was watching this and he thought, all right, what if I cut that hole open? to give the butterfly a little bit more space and it will be able to come out quicker and then I can see what, what happens. So he gets his surgical blade and he opens up the sack for, that, for, the, for the butterfly, okay? And the butterfly basically emerges very quickly and then just lies there on the table and he's like, fantastic. I'm going to wait for the wings to come out and for it to fly off and we'll see it. And he waited and he waited came back the next day and it was dead. And he was like, hmm, what happened? What did I do? So he goes back and he looks at, the, he looks at another poo pie sack with a tiny hole and then he watches what the butterfly do, was doing. And it took maybe three or four days for a butterfly to squeeze itself through that tiny hole. And what he asserted or what he discovered was that hole had to be tiny and difficult and hard for the butterfly to get through because the butterfly was kind of, that was how it was strengthening its wings and it's strengthening its, its muscles or whatever the insects have, I don't know, it's not muscles, but um, that, that was how it was getting strong. So by the time that it emerged through that tiny hole, it had been working out for like five days. And when it emerges from the hole and it had kind of broken the sack through itself, then its wings were strong enough to open and then it could fly off. And I think that's maybe a, a kind of a metaphor in, 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 in sort of saying the importance of, the, of, the, um, of adversity, if you like, or being able to, you know, we, we don't know the meaning of circumstances because we're not able to always see the entire 
breadth of perspective or the alternative. Yeah, thank you Absolutely. for that, Ryan. Absolutely. I've been I've been looking for that, and now I found it. You, you found are my, it. You're my you hero of the day. <laughs> that was brilliant. We did it. <laughs> we did it. We did it. I mean, let, let's 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 face it: racism, sexism, any sort of ism based upon external characteristics is is just detrimental to society. It's detrimental to the social functioning of human beings. You know. Um, that goes without saying, right? Now, at the same time, what the points that have been brought up today is that um, apathy, victimhood, um, entitlement, all these are also scourges that, that, that do not contribute necessarily to the growth of humanity, right? So where these, where these conversations of victimhood or entitlement are entering into conversations about racism and sexism, can we not draw a line between the two? Can we not say, okay, yeah, let's let's address sexism, let's address racism, let's do what we can as humanity to ensure that all human beings have as much opportunity, like you said, Lance, as much opportunity as they can have. And then let's empower them, let's give them the tools so that they can succeed, so that they can thrive, so that they can prosper. Um, it's a large conversation, right? We've spent this whole entire episode talking about it, um, but beneath it, hopefully, what 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 we what I would like the conversation to center around is the idea that um, just consider for a second that financial abundance and understanding how to use and operate with money and capital systems is a bigger part of the equation and a bigger answer and a part of the solution than we may actually give it credit for. Mm. You know, I mean, I love entrepreneurship programs that go into disadvantaged neighborhoods and teach teach kids that come from these families where they would. I mean, I was talking with a friend of mine actually just the other day. It was like his his name's Fred. He is he's like six foot five. He's sixty five years old, African American guy. Grew up in Brooklyn, and um, uh, actually, I think he said he grew up in the Bronx. But he said he said literally he told me what it was like living there, and I was just like. He's like, yeah, when I grew up, I grew, I grew up in the Bronx in the 80s. He's like, the, the late 70s and the 80s, it was a war zone. It was a war zone. He said, everyone, all my colleagues that I grew up with, they're either dead or they're incarcerated or they're completely dysfunctional human beings, you know? And I was like, how did you, how did you escape that situation? Because now he's a, he's a basketball coach at a, at a very high-end private, um, private school in Baltimore. So he works at a, as a as a basketball coach at this very wealthy this this private school for wealthy people, and uh, and I was like and I asked him I said Fred how did you how did you escape such a situation when you had so surrounded by this common theme of so much destruction so much negative patterns so much trauma, and he said I don't know I, just, I had something in me he's like for whatever reason I would get up every morning and I would get to not every morning I would get up every Sunday and I would go to church. He's like, and there's just something inside of me that wanted to get up every morning and go to church. And I saw what people were doing around me. I decided not to do it, you know? So I think it's the contrast. Stories exactly. like that give me, they give me hope for, for us as humanity, for yeah, human beings I, and the nobility it, of the human soul. Definitely. Yeah. Same here. I, I think it's the contrast. So even though I crapped on great aunt uh, earlier in the, in the podcast, that was the contrast that I got to see. As somebody who grew up on an Indian reservation, I got this. I that's I think part of it is understanding that whole of the world out there. While you're in, for instance, if you're in like an urban ghetto and you're in one of these food deserts, which is which is real. Like they actually don't. A lot of those folks don't have. They can't just walk to a Safeway like us, like me, and go get fresh vegetables. It's a, it's a real circumstance. One hundred percent. Redlining was a is a real governmental uh, thing with you know. So that kind of level of systemic racism is absolutely real. I think it's I think it's seeing the opportunity to be able to see out, and then also be able to hear. And then I would add technology onto the top of that one in in terms of not only is it capital like you talked about, Enoch, but now with the technology that is out there and the information that's available. Uh, everybody, uh, most people can pretty much self-teach themselves almost anything at this point. I mean, that is a reality of the situation. And it really comes down to self-discipline again, understanding where you're centered, 
understanding like where you're at and then moving it from there and moving with things that compel you in a positive way. Like you said, Enoch, even if it is, I don't know, I just went to church and then that's where I saw my, saw the contrast in life. And that was the thing that's, that centered me. I, I found myself in, in God or, or anything like that. Or I had this one positive friend and I just clung to them in those kind of situations. Um, it, you, you were obviously up against, if you're that person, it's like, I really think my life is analogous to a lot of that as somebody, I'm the only person in my family to have a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, a master's degree, the only, and one of the first ones to own, mul- actually the only one to own multiple businesses now at this point or do any kind of real estate development and level that we have. Every day is pushing a boulder up a mountain. Every single day. But even before we started recording today, we were talking about, you saw the snow behind me in, our, in the windows in the building I'm sitting in. And I was like, ah, I ruined my fishing day. You're like, wow, you must be doing pretty good if you've earned the, you know, you could take some time off. I go, yeah, it was earned. It's an earned luxury. It's an earned mm-hmm. privilege. Mm-hmm. It took many sacrificial Sundays and Saturdays working to, to get there. So I just would, I, it's a, a, all the way back to the beginning and the, and the truth. And, and just, if we're going to have this, if we're going to lean one way, great. Let's lean the other way too at the same time. And let's just have an open discussion and recognize reality. And what is the objective truth? And what has worked for millennia to get there? And it's all of those things. Great. All right, gentlemen. Well, I don't know about you. I'm kind of all talked out. That's I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for that analogy. I'm going to use that from now on. That is fantastic. Excellent. That Excellent. was a good one. Yeah, I could see I could see the butterfly straining. And when they, um, when they do spread their wings, it's quite amazing. And uh, I was just just on to end up on a note, which is just from my personal experience, because that's really all I can speak about. I was having a conversation with uh, with a friend of mine, um, wonderful lady, mentor, coach, um, amazing woman, spiritual leader. Um, she's written a couple books, but anyways, uh, she was sharing with me how she came from a traumatic childhood, her uh, raised by a single mother. Single mother um, was basically on drugs all the time. Um, she was she was molested by a close family member repeatedly as a child. I mean, just horrific things that that she experienced, you know. And then I shared some of my experience about when I grew up and my mom committing suicide when I was sixteen and and becoming an alcoholic before that, and and you know what it's like to to see a parent as a child and realize you're more you're more of an adult than they are, and you're having to take care of them. I mean, just like so, there's this trauma. And she she looked at me and she said, you know, I was kind of. I guess I was bemoaning my fate a little bit. I was like, you know, life has been hard and, you know, I've, I've, I've worked hard to get where I'm at, but you know, all the trauma that I've suffered, it's difficult dealing with this stuff. And she said, well, you know what? People that are raised in less adverse circumstances, she's like, my experience has been oftentimes they might not have the incentive to dig deep and discover who they really are. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. You know? Yeah, because as I'm here talking to both you guys, I know that each of you have experienced your own personal journeys, your own personal challenges. You've had to dig deep, and you've had to discover like who you really are. And as you've discovered who you really are, you you found, I'm certain, because I found the same thing. Yet your source of strength, your source of um, persistence, your source of determination, your source of intelligence is an inexhaustible well that just keeps on going. I don't think either of you could say you found the limit to your own compassion or love. It's have you weird. have you reached have you reached the bottom of that well, Lance, of your own no. personal You know power? what's crazy to me is like the bigger challenges that God gives me then it's like then I there's another one right after that. I just, I just, I'm not, it just continually blows my mind. It just continually blows my mind. You're breaking out of the cocoon, man. It's giving you a lot of cocoons to, to, to work your way out of. Yeah. You're obviously the, the, you obviously are done with the tests for the most part. Like that's for me, that's a sort of some sort of comfort where I'm like, okay, I'm done with architectural tests. I'm done with general contracting tests, Hmm. but then there's the projects and they keep getting more and more and more. And so that's where I'm at. Um, I will say I hit a pretty big, big period of burnout though in 2020 and 2021 and kind of, kind of mm. went blank. And uh, I mean, I would, uh, I just gave a half ass effort for the firms in those two years. And uh, I just, I fished. Like I literally just went, obs- mm. I just obsessed with hiking and fishing and, and doing that. Um, so 
that was probably the first time I really ever hit burnout. That's kind of my mm. take. Yeah, sometimes we need that. Well, good on you for, for, for resting and relaxing. Another another quick anecdote that I want to share. Uh, I was so I was down in I was down in uh, Dana Point, California, which, as you can imagine, is a very very wealthy area. Um, you're not going to get down there with real estate under a million dollars. And I was talking to a guy who's independently wealthy. He's run head fund managers. I mean, he has millions to his name. Very successful guy. And we were we were sitting around at a little round table talking with some of the guys. And one of the guys at the table was like, has just had a real rough couple of months. So um, in December, he had a um, he had a blood clot in a kidney that hospitalized him on Christmas Eve. He spent, it was life-threatening. They couldn't figure out what it was. So he spent basically two weeks in the hospital. Um, at the same time, he's having marriage difficulties with his wife. He's been married for two years, a blended family, but there's there's no sexual intimacy happening in the marriage. And he's just extremely frustrated, extremely up. You know, he's like, he's just suffering as a man in this relationship, although he loves his wife. Um, and on top of that, uh, he had a couple of his employees quit um, they poached a couple of his clients and he decided he wants wow. to shut down his business. So he had like these three life events happening. His business is being shut down. Uh, he's di- he's really struggling on the home front with his relationship with his wife. And, um, and the other thing was the health impact of like having this kidney thing, right? And so I was, I was listening to him and I just, I said, I was like, oh, Phil, man, that sounds really terrible. I mean, I'm so sorry to hear that. It sounds so tough. You know, and then Keith, the guy next to me, who's like this really successful entrepreneur, he's like, "Don't give him that." He's all, "Man, what are you talking about? God just put a couple more plates on his on his bar there, man. He's he's building some serious muscles right now." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it I came, thought, and it wow. came in threes, right? Came in threes. Well, came in threes. I don't know much more problem. It's, it's not that TD Jakes. Um, is it TD Jakes, the pastor in the U.S. Um, who gives a speech and he talks about, you know. I asked God to make me powerful and to make me strong, and He gave me. And then He lists out a whole. He load gave of, me a, a child. It, he gave me. <laughs> he starts listing out all the different challenges and yeah. you know adversities yeah. that he had to he had to go through. What I thought was so so fascinating was that the guy who was more was pretty successful. He had a very different reaction to this this other man's misfortune, whereas my reaction was one of almost probably. You know, trying to demonstrate some empathy and some compassion for a situation. The guy to my right was just like, dude, buck up, buddy, man. Amazing. Count your blessings that you've been able to have this challenge Mm. to be able to build more reps and becoming a stronger human being. And I thought, wow, what an empowering way to look at it as opposed to maybe some different ways that we could look at these kind of situations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. there, There is that freedom and choice. There is a freedom and choice in how we want to perceive, Mm. interpret choose the situation agreed agreed i wish i wish that was taught more um and less on blaming uh society or our circumstances for and complaining about where we're at yeah that's the whole exactly it's it's just about the messaging and that there's um, so thanks for having me on today guys uh that's that was that's kind of it for me is like i just want people to hear it I just want people to hear it and know that like there's an opposite take on the whole thing. And maybe the answer is, it seems like it is. It's that maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, if, if my views are extreme in that in, in any way, okay, fine. Then I'm just countering the other extreme reviews. And, and then this gray area in the middle, that's life. That's how life works. Well, we're super glad we could have you on Lance. It is good to hear, like you said, a different, a different perspective. Um, and we're, we're, we're happy to entertain that conversation. So anyone else that wants to come on the podcast and enter into a, a lively debate or conversation and share your, your viewpoint and opinion, um, uh, that'll be great. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. BIM, as we know, is very important. But it's not the only thing you need for your next project. That's why it's important that 95% of manufacturers who offer free BIM files on RCAT also have another type of data for your project needs. That means that if you go to RCAT.com, 95% of the products with BIM also have CAD files 
also have a specification, as well as being able to use the patented spec wizard tool. And they also have project information to help you make the right selection for your next project. So stop going to a site with just BIM. Go check out our sponsor, rcat.com, to get everything you need for your next project for free and without registering, which is pretty cool. That's rcat, A-R-C-A-T dot com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.